three months. A Pretoria man convicted of possessing child pornography appearing in court today. Gerard Alberts pleading guilty to several charges last year, but he's been battling for nearly six years to keep the evidence out of court. Our reporter Karen Morn has been tracking this ENCA exclusive. She's with us now on Newsnight. Firstly, what are the exact nature of the charges that uh, he is facing and those that he's pleaded guilty to? Well, he was essentially found with over 40,000 images of child pornography on his um, computer, also 22 very explicit videos of children being raped and sexually abused on camera over prolonged periods of time. He has pleaded gl guilty to 500 charges of possession of child pornography. Of course, he's not saying that he distributed it or manufactured it, but is now trying to persuade the court that he should not go to jail and should rather be given either a suspended sentence, correctional supervision, or some kind of community service as penance for those particular charges. We'll talk about his uh, attempts at justification in just a moment in order to reach that, but uh, we're talking 500 counts. What did you say? 40,000 images. I mean, these are astonishing, almost unbelievable numbers, aren't they? Well, what's interesting is that what we understand is that his psychologist, who he's uh, appointed to kind of be his main source of mitigating evidence, is going to argue that he's actually not uh, someone who displays the tendencies of a paedophile, but is in, in fact a hoarder who likes to collect things. In fact, I think you make the point a misunderstood collector. That was, yeah. that was the way in which yeah. he described himself to police in the immediate aftermath of the arrest. The fascinating aspect of the story, and unfortunately for him, is that he uh, caused this raid on his premises by, in fact, approaching an undercover American agent and asking him very specifically, Jeremy, to persuade him, uh, to pers supply him with a number of very explicit images of children being abused with various objects and, and beings. Now, that transcript provided fodder for the SAPS to go to his home, raid it and find these images and his battle to stop those images from being put before the court involved him going to the high court and arguing that search and seizure was illegal. Of course that failed. He's now pleaded guilty and he's now trying to persuade the court that he shouldn't go to jail. The, the way in which he contacted the agent and the way in which the agent, I presume you're talking about someone from the FBI in the United States, how, how then did they contact the South African police? How did the, how did the circle close? Well it's fascinating because we have seen these kind of cases coming up in the past. Remember there was that very famous case of Jonathan Ulse, who was a South African man, 19 years old, ran a kiddie porn ring in the States. The Americans cottoned on. When he came back here, there was cooperative attempts by the South Africans to get him back there. There is a very cooperative re relationship between America and South Africa on these kind of issues. They felt that the level of, of um, kind of the the detail that he provided in asking or actually placing an order for child pornography demonstrated to them that he was in fact quite a profoundly dangerous individual who could harm children and that was why they of course passed that information onto the SAPS, the SAPS reacted. Take us into court today, what was it like? He's a very interesting character. You'll see from those shots, um, we had a very intrepid uh, camera guy who managed to get images of him as he was walking in. He was completely oblivious to the fact that we actually had a camera there. As soon as he, reali as he realized, he was completely distraught about our presence, didn't want us taking photos of him, didn't want to be seen on camera, which given the nature of the charges he, uh, he has pleaded guilty to is, is understandable. A very... Um, very sort of engaged person, constantly talking to the lawyers, constantly pointing out aspects that he wanted clarified with the state. This is a person who's char changed his lawyers three times and has certainly showed a massive propensity to one might say use legal technicalities and loopholes to prolong this case for as long as possible. And they're the pictures we see as, as he's leaving court now uh, under a hood of some sort. Uh, you actually put a fairly blunt question to him, didn't you? Uh, I specifically asked him, are you a paedophile? Um, of course, he didn't answer to that. I also asked him, why did you plead guilty to those charges? Um, we know that he insists he is not a paedophile. He says he just likes to uh, collect strange things. And uh, just finally then, how long is this going to take before we reach some sort of uh, conclusion? Well, They've got to iron out, the state and the defense have to iron out their differences over the psychologist report. Of course, they're very unhappy because it contains information that they're not happy about uh, being published. The, the thing will re return to court, the case will return to court on the 13th of March. There should be some finality about the expert evidence on the 7th. All right, that's where we'll leave it. Uh, Karen Morn's a full report here on Newsnight a little later on uh, this evening. ENCA reporter Karen Morn. There have been uh, new developments tonight in the Amplat saga. The mining giant says it's now held constructive talks with the Mineral Resources Minister.